Hey creators, welcome back to the club. The Black Creators Club is your go-to resource for all the Black movers and shakers in Hollywood, reactions to the latest pop culture tea, and of course, our own entertainment pursuits. Today, we are switching it up and we have an amazing special guest, Kiana Woodson. Hey! Oh, cute, cute audience applause. Yes. Right. <laughs> 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 she is a director, a visionary, and Agora Award nominee, and I am so excited and honored to have her here um, with us today. We are going to be talking about Black lives, the Black community, what that looks like um, internally with family dynamics, with children dynamics, and the overall viewpoint um, as a director and get her opinion on that. We are going to then get into our game that we call, are you in the room? Or are you in the hallway, darling? Mm -hmm. Then we're going to sign out. So I hope you guys are enjoying, going to enjoy this beautiful show that we have together for you. So let's get right into it. Yes, yes. Thank you again, Kiana. I think this is going to be such a good conversation. As Evan A said, like we have so much that we want to talk to you about about being a director, et cetera, et cetera. Let's start there. Take us to the very beginning. Like, when did you realize you wanted to be a director and how did you go about making it a reality? Let's hear about the journey. Okay, first, thank you guys for having me. I feel very honored to be on the show, so I'm very excited. Um, so where do we start? Let's start at Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta. Um, I came in actually as a fashion major and got a Mac, got a camera, and was like making just videos for fun with my friends and ended up making videos on campus. And, you know, I was still very much into fashion. And I had an RA who saw my work and was just like, hey, you should change your major. And I was like, why? <laughs> I'm like, no, I want to be a fashion designer. I've wanted to do fashion since I was 12, like been sketching my entire life. And he's like, no, you should change your major. He's like, your stuff that you do to promote things on campus are better than some of my classmates work. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. So I went home, this was after the first semester at Clark Atlanta. Right. I went home and I thought about it and I was like, you know, I've done fashion. Like I've, I've sketched, I've taught myself how to do that. Maybe if I want to get back into it, I can go back into it, but I don't really know much about video. And if I'm going to pay for school, I might as well learn something that I don't really know. So I ended up changing my major and never looked back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and ended up learning so much, had an amazing teacher we call Dr. E, who happens to be Spike Lee's mentor in the Atlanta University Center. And I had a film critique class. And just from that class alone, I fell in love with movies and then continued pursuing it. After I graduated, I was like, I just want to keep going. I went to Savannah College of Art and Design in, the, in Atlanta and found out I wanted to direct, loved working with actors and never looked back That's at all. That's so amazing. And so in, it's crazy how like divine intervention sometimes really like steps yeah. in there because if that, if you would have never met that professor, right? You would have yeah, been- Yeah, my RA. My actual RA, RA, the RA, RA yeah. in, my, in my dorm. <laughs> even that, like so outside even, of the classroom, right? <laughs> outside of the classroom and seeing what it is that you did and then being like encouraging you to change your major. And now this is like your whole career path when you could have been like really a fashion major, you know, what I'm, like it really guided you in a way that you wouldn't have even yeah. expected. And so I think it's very important sometimes to even take advice or to listen to what people see in you. Cause sometimes mm -hmm. you don't even see those things mm -hmm. in yourself. Very, yeah. very, very true. That is literally my whole life testament. Like a lot of people end up seeing things in me. I end up seeing things in myself the older I got, but when I was younger, a lot of people saw things in me that I didn't even realize. So it's definitely helped me along my path, I would say. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, so you were making your mark in Atlanta. <laughs> Let's okay. talk about that. You went to Clark, <laughs> went to CAU, which yeah, shout out to the HBCUs of the world. Like you definitely did your thing there. Um, but now you live in Los Angeles. How would you compare? Because now we're hearing, especially this whole Black Renaissance happening in Atlanta. Yes. Shout out to Tyler Perry, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> How would you compare the two locations, director standpoint? You right. know, specifically, and if you could dial in a little further for for a Black female director standpoint, what's your recommendation on, on either location? 
Yeah, um, the worlds are completely different. I think just as a director, period, I think you can direct from anywhere. Like you can pick up any camera, iPhone, anything, direct something and make it happen. But for a professional career, um, actually after graduating from SCAD, I had to think, okay, where is going to be the best place for me to go? Because though production is coming to Atlanta. So the people that are really like on sets, like your camera department, your um, your people who are doing locations, people who are doing catering, all those people that are in production, it's gonna be great for you in Atlanta. But as a director, the studios aren't there. So if you wanted to be, you know, go to those meetings, meet people um, and then get those chances to pitch for a job, like you're not gonna get those in Atlanta to be real, unless you're doing your own independent projects. So I felt that it was a better place for me to come to LA. There's also more opportunities here, more programs, more fellowships. And I was like, if I'm going to actually wanna work as a director and not just you know, be a PA and try to work my way up, um, which is not bad, but that's just not a path that I wanted to take initially. Um, I thought that coming to LA would be the best bet. And I also wanted to work in the industry while I was working on my directing career. So you asked about black women directors too. Mm -hmm. I think it goes to the same. I think it's it's all the same. I think as black directors and black women directors, it's like 10 times harder, Mm -hmm. obviously to make it in the industry. So you're still gonna have to work a hundred times harder um, to even make it a reality. Um, It's just that, you'll end up a little bit with like a little bit more opportunity here yeah. to actually go, make it happen. Can you go into that? Like, I guess as a black director, as a black person in the industry, like what exactly makes it harder for you? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was like, I was like Ooh, yeah, <laughs> <you sigh. laughs> I think film in general is just natural a boys club type of place you hear about boys and their cameras and like oh I got into the films like you hear about it yeah. and I think they very much keep it a boys club and I think as a woman it's really hard to break that and as a black woman it's really really hard to break that like how many times have we seen the same white narrative over and over again and how many times have we seen a black version of it it's mm-hmm. like it's, it's hard to make that a reality and I think being a black woman and coming from that point of view, like you're just always going to have a wall up against you against in any industry. And I think it's just extremely, extremely hard to do it. I think in this industry, Um, but you still have to go for it. And I feel like if I was in Atlanta, I think it would be way, way harder for me to make that happen because it's already a wall against me. So if I can at least go to go somewhere where there's at least other people doing it and I'm seeing it way more and I can connect with someone that might be able to help me along or I can end up in this fellowships for, you know, black women that there are a lot of those here. I can at least go for those or work with other creators. And I just feel like it's just more of a hub. It's just a better opportunity all around. Hopefully that answered your question. Oh, 100%. That does. 100%. That does. I mean, I think that, you know, being in the industry, it is difficult. And to even, Mm. you know, add on with seeing the white narrative and like a different narrative as a black version, I, I, for whatever reason, whatever came to my head right now was like, curb your enthusiasm, 30 rock, right? And then you have Mm -hmm. like, the black like um what was it the black sketch show that was on like HBO? Yeah, black Black lady Lady sketch show. Mm -hmm. And then there was like, you know, Akila and I talked about this before. It was like black AF, right? And yeah. I feel like the mm-hmm. response time that you get on any of these things. Oh, look, people are already calling me. What's happening? They ready. They, they, they ready to chime in. On Listen, what they're like, let saying. me get in on the podcast. <laughs> let let me be here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so it. I think like the black version of, of those types of shows. And I'm thinking like, the response to them is so different, right? Like you have 30 Rock and Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's like, oh, those are classics. Those are up here, award winning, Emmy nominated, blah, blah, blah. But then on the black side, it, I don't know if it- Even if you- Right. There's there's a complete disconnect. It makes me think of friends and living single. Like right. people don't even think living single existed. And I'm just like, living single came first. What are you talking mm-hmm. about? 
the idea for friends i mean no no offense they to anybody said. else but it came first <laughs> like yeah. the idea was the white living single <laughs> like mm-hmm. and that's and it worked and it came that way and they the way they market it is totally different too like it's just they add like i'm going to keep bringing up this wall there's like a wall in front of black content that white content does not have yeah. like yeah. even goes into career like there's there, it's just going to be a wall and i think this you know we probably talk about later but just talking about now and the times that we're in and how the wall looks like it's actually coming down um mm-hmm. which is exciting um because yeah. for so long it's it's been up and it's been blocking us from having those chances to share our version or our narrative that's unique to our you know our community yeah yeah well you know what we can deep dive into it right now you know let's have a let's have a fluid conversation about 2020 and the complete yes. Just all you need to do. Twenty twenty will be a verb, a noun, a li- like Girl. an experience that we would li- we would understand yes. for generations to come. But you know, one thing that's made it that's come to the forefront at the same time was just the mainstream popularity of sharing, of telling, of encouraging other people to share and tell black stories. So you know, based on what we were just talking about, like what do you think about this, and how have you seen? Um, you know, folks been able to tap into this new momentum of, of what it means to really share Black stories. Yeah, um, 2020, boy, <laughs> what a year. Um, yeah. It is, it's funny because it's like everyone's like, oh, I'm going into 2020 with 2020 vision. Well, we yes. got what we wanted. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I guess it was, like, <laughs> it was your time to find your 2020 vision. If you it was, it, it, it really was. was. It's like, you know, <laughs> Every, this is the year of revealing truth and it's revealing dark times uh dark things that we thought might have been like you know oh it's in the past we're in a post-racial society this. no we're not right <laughs> like you know this is definitely that time that we're we're really seeing that but I will say social media social media has been an interesting place um and I think it's a, a contributor to this coming to light and being a vehicle mm-hmm. for a lot of stuff coming to light as we saw like other than like you know the racial issues that we've been having in our country with George Floyd and how big that was mm-hmm. um and Breonna Taylor but also you had employees coming on Twitter talking about their experiences at their jobs we've mm-hmm. had people you know over the last couple of years Oscar's so white that hashtag you know going off every year and being like we are holding you accountable and you know I think after everyone was putting up their black squares um yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think people were really like hey let's take a moment and see like what more we can do I mean for some people I'm sure it was like let's do something that's gonna you know give us a little pat on our back but we're seeing change we're seeing you know higher ups like more black higher ups. I've been looking mm-hmm. on deadline and seeing like all these people come into different yes. like, companies. And I'm just like, wow, seeing a lot of first, first black woman, first black man, first mm-hmm. black this. And I'm just like, wow, that's crazy that we're the first in 2020, but <laughs> right. especially in an industry that's literally been over around for like over a hundred years, like it's amazing. But also I think we're seeing a lot more. There's a lot more of a need for it because we're asking for it. And at the end of the day, we're the consumer, we run everything. And mm. the industry itself runs on money. Like, yeah, it's a art, but it's an industry. It's a business. Yeah. And that's like, what I always you have say. To sell. I always say yeah. that like, the black dollar is the one that like keeps the keeps the the momentum going in the economy, in my opinion, because we're the ones mm-hmm. that are buying in the most. We're the ones that are, you know, the mentality's different because of our societal environments and so we're the Mm -hmm. ones that are probably putting out more and not investing you get what I'm saying so we're the ones that kind of keep it going um the thing that you said and I love that you said accountability right like keeping Mm -hmm. people accountable or keeping these corporations accountable and I think that's important too to like point out and to highlight because 
this whole time it's kind of been like swept under the rug what the black experience was yeah. and even though we've been saying it it's been on camera it's been out there no one was really listening and then all of a sudden 2020 hit we're all stuck in the house and now everyone's like oh my word I had no idea you know <laughs> it's like okay well we've been trying to tell you since Rodney King we've been trying to tell you since the KKK mm -hmm. like we've been right said this this is not a new concept um but now to see with our generation with Twitter, mm -hmm. cancel culture, we're all able to kind of hold these bigger corporations accountable for their actions, right. what they say, and how they are going to roll out that plan in the future. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I agree. I think it's, it kind of goes back to like, I think of when we were learning about civil rights and how we would, we would see it in movies too, but you know, we learn this in history, like when they started, um, I forgot what event it was. It was when they the sit in counter that green I think it, um, it was a sit in counter but it wasn't even mm -hmm. I think it was bloody Sunday where oh, they showed it on TV mm -hmm. and yeah. people's families were actually seeing what was happening and that's where you got like I think a lot of white our white counterparts coming out to being like no this is wrong like and internationally too Absolutely. right and then actually and I think mm -hmm. it's the same thing with social media we're so connected to everybody around the world like they can see what's happening here we can see what's happening there when you think of SARS in Nigeria like we can, mm -hmm. we can see everything. So it's like, it's not just, you know, oh, Nigeria's a black community in America. They're just complaining and no one else sees yeah. it. Everyone's blind to it. You cannot be blind to it in 2020. You can't. It just, right. It's, it's, it, it's it in your face. You can't, you can. That's an excuse that doesn't count anymore. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, if mm -hmm. you're ignoring it, you're ignoring it on purpose. And I now know the person that you are. You have no excuse. Absolutely. It's everywhere. Absolutely. You have every notification on your phone. You, and that's, what are we doing about it? What are we doing? There we go. And that's kind of what I see and why I love just the media industry as a whole, mm -hmm. because I think we're able to shed light on what's happening, yes. put it in front of people's faces. And then they're, you know, and sometimes have a call to action. Like, you know, is that going back to your inspiration for being a director or wanting to, you know, excel in this field? What is it, the core inspiration for why you are doing what you do and why you're focusing so much on, on Black stories? A hundred percent. I, it, that is everything. I think as a director, as a filmmaker, as a person who wants to be in this work, like you are sharing messages, you are telling stories that will relate to someone. It might not be a person that looks to you, looks like you, but it might relate to this person that looks like you. Like when I think about movies that I've watched growing up, like I'm a Jamaican American girl, comes from an immigrant mom. Oh my God, me too, me. Hey, what? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, my mom is, you know, my mom is an immigrant. My dad is from New York, but I was raised in a city because I was raised in Jersey, but I also in high school, I moved to the rural South. Like what, where's my coming of age story? Like granted, yeah, I have to write that myself, but it's like, I'm not the only person who doesn't have a story that's not told. There are so many people, I haven't seen as many native stories, any East Asian stories, South Asian stories. Like I'm a big Bollywood fan. And like, I would love to see more stories about them. I know Mindy Kaling had a show on Netflix that came out and it's like, how long has it taken for us to get a, a coming of age story about a South Asian girl? Like Latinx stories and those becoming popular now. And you know, we're seeing those more. There's so many people's stories that haven't been told because we've had over a hundred years of the same white narrative. Like. Mm. Where honestly, Kiana, literally, like <laughs> yeah. I was I was looking mm -hmm. at something too. Um, and I was like, wow, like to really think that Crazy Rich Asians is like the first full like Asian cast movie we've seen. It's insane. It's, it's, it's insane. it doesn't and, make any sense. And that's what you sometimes need though, because I think they they took a leap. Um, I think with the Warner Brothers creation, took a leap, they recognized how great it was in the box office. And now right. folks are telling more Asian American stories. So when it goes back to, yes, we do the creative, but at the end of the day, this is a business. And so I think as much as we're saying, we wanna see these stories, our voices matter too, our stories matter too. I am still curious at what we need to do from a business perspective to showcase that you know it's actually important and it makes revenue enough for folks right. to care more because it's not a social cause. Like, sorry, the media right. industry is not a social cause. It's, it's a business that mm. happens to be focused on entertaining folks. And so, I don't know, I think that's the age old question. And it perhaps goes back to what 
Ebene was saying earlier in terms of the just the black dollar and potentially spending more on black related content and folks showing up more for black related content so that right. we get the numbers up who who knows who knows but we are that's mm-hmm. that's the thing it's like it's not even anything that we really have to figure out because it's something that has been proven time and time again mm. the success of crazy rich asians the success of black panther look how surprised yeah. they were when straight out of compton came out and then they were just like wow people actually wanted <laughs> to see this what do you mean people want us to see this? It's NWA. What are you talking about? Like it's true. It's true. It's like, why is it a surprise to y'all? Y'all are trying mm-hmm. to keep the same people and try to use no offense, but Tom Cruise in every movie. Like, mm. there are so many other people that we like we want to see. We want to see new people. We want to see new stories. You're right. Like, we can't keep staying with the same approach. We can't reboot everything. There exactly. are things that can be told. There are stories that haven't been told. Like, and we're gonna come out for them. If we see ourselves in a movie we are going to come out to see it. Look at the Bollywood industry. They make more movies than Hollywood does like on any day, Mm. like a ridiculous amount. And they're like a crazy billion dollar industry in India. Look at their YouTube numbers. YouTube, like India runs YouTube (laughs) for real. Korea, like K-pop, that's music, but still same thing. If you're seeing yourself, you're going to support it. It's, it's like an age old thing. They're just, it's like, you're choosing not to do it. Choosing like not to. Exist. And how many, how many case studies do we need to show? Because like, exactly. said, like, even what you were just able to name, that's quite enough to say, all right, let's double down on this. But yeah, exactly. but why for every one case study to create this, we need 20. Like this exactly. doesn't make any sense. You're right. Absolutely. We're always have to mm-hmm. do everything like tenfold. Um, I was watching Ma Rainey's Black Bottom yesterday, and then we I watched, watched it yesterday mm-hmm. too. Okay, and then we watched that like director's like thirty minute director's cut at the end. Um, mm-hmm. like they had another like special, and they were just saying that basically, <laughs> like Ma Rainey, she knew that like you know the white man doesn't care about her; he cares what she can do for him right Mm -hmm. and I was like that's so interesting like they're not interested in the black story or the black narrative or unless it's gonna make them money you know what I mean right because they're the ones that are controlling the Warner Brothers the you know owns the BETs the whatever else right um the VH1 whatever other like crazy network HBO yeah so to see that story and it I was like wow like that's so interesting I mean there were so many good points in what he said but I was like that right now what we're talking about like that just relates I was like that's so true like they're not going to invest the money in behind a black narrative well us as black people being like we would see it we would see it they don't see us as money makers (laughs) you know what I'm saying they don't see us as the people that are putting money in their pocket they're like oh well if a white person's gonna see it and another Asian person's gonna see it okay well there's a huge wide range of people that want to watch like like you said, mm. um, straight out of Compton, it wasn't just us going to see it. It was literally everybody. No. So now mm-hmm. they're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. We don't know because they don't know the culture. Mm-hmm. And so that's why they don't necessarily push forward any other racial um, um, narratives. That's why we don't really see them unless it's like maybe um, like an independent film or what is it, A24 or something? Yeah, like- oh, A24 really does it well all the time. They do. Oh. <laughs> they they, do not they really do. <laughs> <laughs> right. They're really good. They have a They're really re- good yes. eye, ear, all of that. I, I'll all get, of they that. They're really good at that. Yeah. All of that. But, but you know what? I was going to say, let's talk about some of your your projects because yeah. we're going to link it all below. <laughs> but I mean, you've been making hits. We're talking about 824. Hits. I see Kiana Woodson. You are, you are going to be there. call me one day. day. Yes, literally. <laughs> I love 824. <laughs> love, love. They've got it. They've definitely got it. But I mean, we saw Willie's, Willie's letter. Mm-hmm. Um, this is one of your first uh, notable projects. And again, uh, for everyone listening, watching, we'll link it all below so you guys can check it out. But um, just walk us through the process, uh, including finalizing the subject, getting your team, finances, production, building awareness. I just want this to be a quick, you know, or as deep as you need to be, overview for folks who may want to follow your footsteps, pursue this path. Like, what do they have to do to get their first project out there? Also, right. too, please mm-hmm. tell us a little background on, like, Willie's letter in case people aren't sure. Out. Yeah. Um, so Willie's letter was a film that I worked on um, with my writing partner, Vanessa Westbrook. Um we were roommates at the time when we came up with the idea. It was like right when I started at SCAD because it, it was my thesis film. And we just had a conversation about, um, so it was Philando Castile that passed, which is where the idea like mm-hmm. kind of butted, it started from there. 
and we were just talking about you know his daughter in the back and Mm -hmm. experiencing that and like how that's going to affect her life later and we just and that same around time we just were talking about the Lily Lynch letter and we're just looking at it and we're just like you know having a discussion like is it real is it not this is most likely a propaganda piece and us reading it but it's like but why do we relate to it so much like why when I read it do I see my family members other people's family members our community at large like there's there's some type of truth to this on how family dynamics are and how you know black women over time has become more in the forefront and we've seen you know black men killed in front of us or you know back to slavery days whipped in front of us like and us, you know, trying to protect our sons and treating them differently from how we protect our daughters, like all those different things. And I remember telling her, I was like, that's my thesis. Hmm. And she was just like, yeah, we should, we should do a film on it. So we began wrote, writing it. It took us about, I think just ideating, it took us about a year because we just wanted to make sure like we were doing it right and researching. We talked to like our, um, she has a friend um, who, you know, studied black, um, Black history and Black studies, African-American studies. And we talked to her, um, reading different things, looking up um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, um, the book by Joy, I can't, I'm trying to pronounce her name. Um, I don't want to get it wrong, <laughs> yeah. but good book, read it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but just looking into all that and then us writing the script, it took us about, yeah, let's say three years. And by the time wow. we got to the end of it, um, at the time I was a brand manager for a Jamaican hair care company um, in Atlanta and I had a pretty good relationship with our boss and she funded the film for me um it was a $15,000 project and she gave me the money for it and I was just like that that's like Mm -hmm. amazing that does everyone doesn't get that and for her to you know believe in me and to back that I that you know that really meant a lot to me and especially because her Mm -hmm. husband was someone who was so big on black pride and mm. you know, our black stories, like Marcus Garvey was a hero for him. Um, Bob Marley was a hero for him. I, we like dedicated the film to him. So, you know, just having that and getting that as a start um, yeah. was a great way to go about doing it and tell that story. And the story is basically about a father and son relationship and the father is pretty much at the end of his life and the end and by the end of his life I mean like the end of his will like he has no Mm -hmm. will left at the end and his family is falling apart and he's taking the path being beaten up by society that he feels like he should take like he's like I have nothing else to give and maybe sacrificing my life is what you know will maybe push my son further even though that's not always true but that's how he logically thinks. And I think it's it's that whole line in the Willie Lynch letter of, you know, you have to kill the mind. Like you have to get rid of the mind of the person. You have to attack it. And that's how you control the people. And his mind was taken, but he's like, maybe that moment, me writing this letter to my son will actually help him to not be like me. And that was pretty much the premise of the entire movie. And it was really hard to make. Um, everything went wrong um we had a location and like um we had a friend's location like her uncle's house like in um in Georgia we lost that because they had a family death like and it was literally the weekend before I had to change oh. the entire shoot weekend I couldn't use anybody from SCAD like I had a really um hard time finding a crew to put it together. I thank this angel named Blair Winters, who was my cinematographer. She's amazing. Um, I worked on, with her on another project that I did while at SCAD and she helped me put a crew together. She used her friends because she's actually, you know, works in the camera department um, in Atlanta. And she, we put a crew together and made it work. And like everything just happened the way that it needed to happen and I'm so proud of that film like it's not perfect and I don't expect like you know all my films to be perfect because I'm still Mm -hmm. you know at the start of my career but I'm I'm so proud of what we were able to do and accomplish with literally like yeah we had a budget but like everything was falling apart (laughs) right (laughs) so it's just like for it to be such a hard journey but us to get it done 
and us to get it out and for us to play it for people and everybody that I've ever we've ever played it for has had a reaction to it in some way Mm -hmm. of being like we played it at um there was like a gathering in Atlanta for like you know people talking about black family dynamics which was Vanessa's um I think it was her cousin or aunt and you know she was telling me like yeah people stood up one girl stood up like I now understand my dad because of your film and people coming and being like wow I've never like thought of thinking of family dynamics like that or I've had a friend tell me like wow this this is like modern day August Wilson that is such a compliment oh, to wow me. Yeah. yeah and then right. just for it to have resonated you know even though we, we just put it out on YouTube um in a non-traditional way because I did festivals and it didn't really do as many festivals as I hoped and mm-hmm. to be honest I was discouraged but then, you know, my my writing partner, she's very much like, that's okay. We're going to put it out on our own. <laughs> and I love her for that. Because I'm just like, I don't know. She's like, we're putting it out. And we put it mm-hmm. out with someone that she knew who was from, you know, the AUC. And he has a, um, a channel called All Urban Central. And we talked to him and he's like, yeah, I want to share more Black creators and more filmmakers and put them on here. Because he has a page that, yeah, it's like a shade room but it's a million people on there. Crazy. So he was mm-hmm. just like, yeah, I'll put it on there for free. And we did, and it gained, it gained 20,000 views. Nice. I Like, that's people that have watched it. And then on the, in the comments, it's like 100 comments about people talking about, wow, that was amazing. Wow, I that resonated with me. Like, people really getting the message, and that's really all we wanted. So mm-hmm. for me, that, my art, I just want people to feel something and to really watch it and take a take away something from it if I don't give you anything then what was the point so yeah right. honestly you said so much and it's so deep and I like want to dive in but um I wanted to just rewind a little bit when you were yeah. saying that your um you had someone to kind of donate or mm-hmm. invest in your project the fifteen thousand dollars right yeah. if someone doesn't have that connection right uh, well, <laughs> yes yes <laughs> what would have been your plan b okay right <laughs> Plan B would have been definitely uh, crowdsourcing. So like using your Kickstarters, using your GoFundMes, like you will really be surprised how many people support you. And those are hard to do. Like those, like people have, you have to have a strategy to definitely get um, money from people. Um, But I feel like if, you know, you make your campaign, honestly be creative with it. Like I always think my favorite campaign has been Dear White People before the film was made, not even the show, like the film. Oh, like, what, did they, what did they do? He did a concept trailer. So he literally mm-hmm. was like, I wanna show people what it is and make it feel like a trailer that you're not going to see, like, where's, where's the movie? <laughs> right. So he like, I, he got his friends together and he, he really like, he shot an actual trailer and it got people's attention because everyone was like, what is this? Like, what, what is this? I wanna see this, I wanna see this. And, yes. what, and he got the money to make the feature. That mm-hmm. is so creative. So, that's so creative. That's like the that's like the Fresh Prince, the new remix. Yeah, um, exactly. It like, works. It, it works because it was if, the you, best. Yeah. if mm-hmm. you put it out, you're just like, hold on. I visually can see it and being like, I want to yes. see that. And mm-hmm. if you don't give money to donate to make it happen, it's not going to happen. Right. So it, right. it kind of gives people an incentive to be like, all right, no, I want to be a part of that. I want to make that happen. Last Black yeah. Man in San Francisco, that was also a campaign. I remember waiting oh. on that movie for four years. Yeah. Like, they came out with it and it wasn't even, it was it was like a concept trailer, um, but they just had the um, protagonist, his name is, I'm blinking for right now, but like he was just riding, you know, through the streets on a skateboard and telling the story, like, and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> but it made you look at it and be like, what is this? This is beautiful. Who made this? Like, I want to mm-hmm. see this. And it, mm-hmm. and it got so much attention that he, you know, Sundance helped him come up with a short after and then doing the film through Sundance and it coming out like, you be, you'll be surprised what you do with just shooting something small and then yeah. it becoming something bigger than it is. Like you just have to be creative and try to prove to people like I can make this happen. Right. And you doing a small trailer or some type of segment is going to show people that no, they can, they can make this happen. If only they had the budget, they can make that happen. Because if you can mm-hmm. do something without anything, then give right. me a budget and watch what I could do with it. Love that. Right. Akila, mm-hmm. do you have any other questions on like her process? 
because I was going to jump no, into I think, the project. So I want to- Yeah, I, that we, right. No, I think, thank you, girl. But I think this whole, that explanation, the biggest thing was the idea, the finances and getting it done. And I think you did all three and you shared all three. And I feel like, you know, by project to project, I'm sure it'll be different, but at least yeah. for this first notable one. Yeah, I think, I mean, guys, if you guys listening, have any questions, send it over. And Slide in the we'll DMs, honey. Have a conversation. Slide <laughs> in the DMs. Um, but no, this was, this was really good. One thing I would want to ask before you jump into the projects, though, yes. is just thinking through what kind of projects you take on. So before we dive into that, I want to just right. have more of an understanding of that. I know when we chatted beforehand, you mentioned the idea of you want to be able to see yourself or see you know, yourself pretty much in other people's work, the other people right. meaning the writer's work. Mm -hmm. Can you just elaborate on that and talk about how you decide which products you want to take on from which ones you, you pass up? Right. Um, so I think from the work that I've done and what I wanted to be ultimately was a writer director, but I also enjoy right like directing other people's work. Um, and I believe that to be a good director, in my opinion, is to see yourself in the work um, because it then becomes personal. So especially when you're working with another person, like I know we'll talk about projects, but I'll bring up the Spire project that I work with Nakia mm -hmm. Stevens and Damn Right Originals, um, which is Endangered. Um, she wrote that project, asked me if I wanted to direct. I read the project and I was able to attach myself to it. And I know that by reading it, I was like, okay, this is about a couple they're about to have a baby. I don't really have kids or anything like that, but it does tap into fears that I felt like I have at with bringing children into the world. And I think fears that most people have bringing, especially black people have bringing children into the world and the dangers and what, what that looks like. Um, and because I know it tapped into my own fears and thinking about, you know, probably when my parents had me and just trying to see myself in that and being like, if I was having a child today, how would I feel? And knowing that it aligned with their, their feelings, I felt like, okay, I can direct this. I have a vision for it. I can, I can make this personal and give you feeling to the viewer who's watching it. And if I feel like I can do that, um, then that's what I'm going to do. I've read projects before, like I've been asked to do projects and like, I didn't see myself in it or it didn't resonate specifically with me and I passed it. And that's hard to do because it's like if someone's paying you for a project, you're just like, right. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. but no. But for the most part, like I was saying before, for me, it's like I want, I want my art to speak. Like I want it to have a message and say something. I don't want to just make films just to make films. Like there's a business side to it, yes, but it's a very much an art to me. It's very much a form of expression, a form of you know game changing in the world or something. Like I wanted to do something. Like mm -hmm. if I don't feel like it's gonna do that or it doesn't attach to me personally, then I feel like I'm not the best person for it. Someone else can do that. Might That might actually have a, a, a attachment to it. So that's just how I look at it. I just make sure that I can see myself. I can really drive home the vision the best way possible. Yeah, it's real. I think that, you know, when you start any project, having a mm -hmm. vision is like the number one thing. Yes. Um, right. You got to have yeah. a vision somewhere to figure out what direction you're going in. Because if you have no relatability to the subject matter, it's like, how are you going to carry it anywhere, take it anywhere, right. have it relate to people, understand what the audience is. So there's so many different elements into that. So I applaud you on staying true and strong to yourself and sticking in to projects that makes sense to you and feel good because like you said when people are paying you it is hard to pass up money and be like yeah nah, I'm not gonna say you know I'm, I'm gonna say yes because I want to get paid but like really I'm stressed because I have no idea what the heck I'm doing on this project right. You know? right so to have integrity especially in like this business applaud 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 yeah, yeah. and um, even to your vision point I wanted to just say quickly like as a director your whole entire job is vision right. yes. so <laughs> if you have none then it's like what are you directing really? Are you just going to be like, oh, I'm just telling directors where to go? Because they don't need you to do that. They're actors. Like, mm -hmm. tell directors, tell actors where they need to go. Right. But like, they're actors. They they know what they need to do. But if you have no vision for them to leap off of or to uh, like add the environment that they need to flourish, then it's like, there's no point in you really being there. You're just 
telling somebody what to do. And that's not, I don't think that's what directing is. It's, it's yeah. a collaboration. It's more of you being like, this is what I see. This is how I want this world to be. And I want you to be able to flourish in it and bring that character to life. That's, that's your job. So if there's no vision and you, you can't attach to it, then it's, it's, you're going to feel it in the finished project. You're going to be like, I don't connect to this because it's not personal. It doesn't feel like you're giving something of yourself to somebody. Yeah. And I feel like, and the viewers might also see that too. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to see it. They're going to be like, I don't, mm -mm. Okay, this doesn't yeah. really have I any think, heart and to I, it. I think we've all probably seen movies or shows where we're like, all right, that was weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> I don't get it, but all right, it's fine. <laughs> um, but to go back to Willie's letter, because I know we touched on it a little bit. Um, when I watched it, some of the emotions I felt um, or things that words that came to mind were impactful, strong, deep, and short, right? Because all of these were like short films. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that we, there was a, a mention of blind spot. Right. So like, mm -hmm. um, so things that you can't see, but maybe others can, um, can you explain that phrase and how it over and how it like ties into the message overall of Willie's letter? Yeah. Um, I think with Willie's letter specifically that line and why we, um, wrote that line is in it was to really kind of bring it all together. I feel like so often, with generational trauma, because the film is really about generational trauma, things become so normal that you don't realize the problem. Mm -hmm. And which is what she was saying. It's like, you don't always see the blind spots that are in your children or in your family or in your mom mm -hmm. or in your dad. You don't, you don't see those things that they don't realize because it's been happening over generations. It's now normal. Um, and I think that kind of goes back to um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, which is what we were looking at when we were writing the film. And this idea that when we were in slavery, right? It seems so far away, right? When we were free, free people, not really, but sure on paper, I guess, um, they didn't give you any therapy for what you saw, for what you endured, for what happened to you and your family. So you have people who have received hundreds of years of abuse and we know how abuse can affect people and how they react to their children. So imagine hundreds of years of, of abuse from a group of people to be free, but you're still receiving abuse from that same group of people just in a different way. Yeah. So when you have consistent abuse, how do you think that's going to affect how that person interacts with their children, how they interact with their spouse, how they interact with their family? Over time, if that has never been fixed to that day, like therapy is such a big deal. Like having that now, like we talk about that now, like self-care, therapy, things like that. But we have had years where therapy has not been a part of the conversation, where trying to fix our generational traumas has not been a part of the conversation. So we're just doing it. So right now it's normal. This is life. Is, oh, that's just how it is. Yeah. No, that's not how it is. It's not. We're just recycling it. Mm -hmm. So and it's I, like, yeah, it's 2020 and we're removed from it, but it's still very much there. The things that our ancestors were going through are still passed through us because it's just coming down through the family. And I think it's and when you're out. when you're somewhat removed, I was gonna say when you're somewhat removed from it, mm -hmm. because yes, it was, you know, years and years and years ago, generations right. ago, I should say. So you don't personally see Mm -hmm. what happened but you're you're able to tell those stories you're able to tell kind of the effects of it. it it becomes harder to treat as well so I mean that's that's a great that's a great way and I feel like now I want to rewatch it with that in mind because you know first of all that sounds like a great book I should look into but also just mm -hmm. the idea of it's not it's hard to treat it's hard to treat <laughs> it is hard to treat I think mm -hmm. it's, it's just it's sad um mm -hmm. and I think often like I know like the conversation is like oh I'm tired of seeing slavery movies true yeah. same right. I think we often don't see effects of slavery absolutely in movies and absolutely. that's what we yeah. want that's to do. what we need to see that's yeah. what we need to that's, see that's, that's <laughs> what we want to do we're like we don't want to it's like okay we're doing Willie Lynn's letter but we don't want to tell a slavery movie no we want to show right. the effects of slavery and yeah it's a short and it's like we you can only do but so much in 15 minutes but it's like Originally, it was a bigger idea, and it's still a big idea that we want to work with and really dive into it because it's that's something we need to see. It's something mm -hmm. that we need to learn from. I feel like movies can help see things in your own family. It can help teach you things. How much Black history have we learned from movies? Right. Like mm -hmm. people that we didn't even know existed. 
And it's like, maybe just maybe watch a movie and you realize I need to have a conversation with my family. I need to figure out how we can heal as a family and move on so that we can, you know, move better as a people. Like it starts with us. I totally Change agree starts with, with us. Kiana, 110 percent. I have to say, just to add into your point, um, when the whole Black Lives Matter thing was going on mm-hmm. and the beginning of quarantine and, you know, we're on a phone call and we're all upset, right, at work because we're like, oh my gosh, like, I feel this way, I feel that way. And everyone and every race had an opinion yeah. and didn't know how to handle it in a way. Um, for me, I felt, okay, like I have an opinion because I'm a black woman in, a, in society. But like, for me, I didn't necessarily have that whole, like, I had a different black experience. Me, right. So for me, I didn't grow up with like black history and like knowing everything, yeah. all the nuances of mm-hmm. everything. So when all of this started happening in quarantine, I was like, oh girl, like, I was like, Tulsa, like, I, this sounds so, like, right. this sounds so bad. No, it's I'm not like, bad. It's not bad. I'm like, I'm like, Tulsa happened. Wait, what the heck? Wait, we burned down a mm-hmm. whole city. Wait, well, what is going on? So I was like, let me. So I literally, when Netflix and Amazon was like highlighting all the black content, I literally went and was like, let me watch all the Malcolm X movies, all the this. I, like, I was literally in there just watching 13 um, that was directed by Ava DuVernay and created by, I was like, mm-hmm. literally, I've watched it at least three times now, right? And to give such a different perspective, it gives me such a different energy with viewpoints, right? And things that my mom would say back in the day, like, oh, you know, you don't trust this, don't do this, be careful about this. You're, oh, mom, mm-hmm. you're crazy. And now it's like, wow, like even the stuff my mom experienced, my mom's in her 60s, right? Mm-hmm. There's things yeah. that she experienced. I'm now seeing exactly what she was talking about. So I think yeah. the, um, the effects are long-term. And I think seeing that in movies and learning through movies, because yeah. that's how we all see, we're all on social media, we're all this. I think that's a great way to um, to continue to push the narrative. Um, I want to move to Endangered, your mm-hmm. film yes. that was on mm-hmm. Aspire Network, which, mm-hmm. woo, that is such a Yay, huge- thank you. Um, mm-hmm. Aspire is like a Black movie network. And so just to even have it televised, um, please tell us how that process went. Like you now film something, you have the idea, we went through all our steps, now, what how how do we get it on tv like how do we do this and if you can um, share the quick log line to endangered again we'll link it but just so folks listening would know what it's right all about. yeah <laughs> um in short endangered is about um a couple that is at their gender reveal party and they're really just talking about the fears of having a child and if it's a girl or a boy how those fears differ um and also how they're the same um just a short segment on Endangered, but right. Endangered, it was great. Um, again, Nakia and Sh- uh, Shanae from Damn Right Originals um, asked me to direct. And we literally had like, what? I wanna say they asked me like a month before we actually started shooting. And then like yeah. to really, really get into it, it was like two weeks. Wow. Um, <laughs> and we shot it in two days. Um, <laughs> So it was, it was an experience. It was like, all right, we're going to do it. All right. We're about to just go on in there. Um, which is nice. Cause I feel like it, it just, it's an experience that I think you learn lessons from and you, you are taught like how to move fast and move quickly. Like you don't have all the time in the world to get this done. Um, but yeah, the process was, it was very simple. The script was already done. Um, it was already locked by the time I came in. Um, we were trying to get casting squared away when I was still going in. So trying to get everybody that we wanted, trying to stay true to like the vision that I gave them. I came in with a lookbook basically um, on what I saw for everything, where it comes from set design to um, clothing, to visually how I wanted to show with lighting, um, the edit, different things. Um, I gave them a full lookbook of my entire vision um, on our first meeting. So nice. they were nice. able to be like, all right, this is great. I love this. We were able to talk about it more. I was able to dive into, you know, just when the key was thinking when she was writing in things like that. And, you know, they were just so helpful, so gracious. It was such a collaborative environment that I absolutely love. Um, black women, so many black women just running things. I love it. Um, but yeah, we were like, all right, we got locations together. We had the crew, um, 
I worked with um, an amazing team, um, amazing um, cinematographer and everything. And we went and shot it and we're in pose for a while <laughs> um, because I wanted it to be perfect. We were in pose for, I don't even know, probably like a month. Not two days, okay. Yeah, not two days, no. Cause I know Adrian was our editor and I know he was just like, oh yeah, I'm about to edit this and it's going to be fine. It's going to come out. And I was like, no, here are my notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, and it was great because it wasn't just me. Like Nikki and Shanae also came in like, here are our notes. Like we want, <laughs> we wanted it to be as perfect as we can get it. And we worked really hard on it. I think I spoke to Adrian every day, wow. every day, like multiple times a day being like, he'll send me, he'll like sit me up in a corner and show me things. And I'm just like, let's do this, change that, move this around. Like, how do we do this? Like some parts of it, I composed myself like for wow. music. Cause we didn't always have resources cause we had a budget, but it wasn't you know, too big of a budget. So some things we have to do ourselves. So I was yeah. like, I can't that find- That honestly leads me to my question of like, how mm-hmm. much as a director, do you actually have your hands on post-production and pre-production? Like how much as a director, like if someone was yeah. listening, like what is it that you actually have your hands on? Yeah, I came in at the end of pre-production. So um, more so just crafting the vision, how I visually saw it. Um, that's when my part came in Um, production was all throughout it of course and then post-production I was heavily involved I I definitely made sure that anything that I saw anything that I you know visually wanted I vocalized it Um, I make sure to speak to the editor often and you know make sure that the cut was something that I was happy with like if I wasn't happy with it I, I did make it known and I vocalized it and you know we worked through it and got it to a place that I absolutely love the film now and it came out you know it came out as a project that I think really resonated with people and that's really all I could ask for yeah um, I loved it I even when we were, it. it was it was Thank great you. and I think and I think also from this perspective of both of us too you're talking about your vision earlier like you know mm-hmm. we we don't have kids or anything of that nature but at the right. same time it's you could or anything of that nature nobody is in the in the bushes but right. it was still very very relatable and I think you know that's what what made it hit home for for all of us so from there from you know post-production deciding on the you know how it would end up look looking as a full package how did you go from there to Aspire yeah did Um, someone have a connection or yeah so it was already Mm -hmm. with Aspire in the beginning so okay even in the beginning yeah gotcha so they had they have a deal with um Aspire to make shorts for them so I'm not sure how many they have a year um, or how long Mm -hmm. the dealers or anything. I don't know the details, but Aspire was there in the beginning. Aspire was on set with us. Um, We also had a McDonald's um, sponsorship as a part of it, which you see the McDonald's drive in the beginning. Right, right, Um, right. McDonald's was on (laughs) set too. Uh, That was fun. Um, You know, just they had, you know, a food stylist there and they had like a representative who made sure that we got the shots the way that we did. I know we didn't want it to be, you know, we didn't want it to feel too commercial, but we wanted to, still you know honor honor the sponsorship of of the film so that's good to know it was was an experience yeah so it sounds like the damn right originals already had a contract with aspire and then to help with you know money and budget and whatever they brought on a sponsorship which was mcdonald's yeah Mm -hmm. okay so like that that's a great way so all you aspiring directors out there okay you get your little contract (laughs) together and then you get a sponsorship honey to help you um in the movie there was like you said what no no go ahead okay i think you're gonna ask the same thing Mm -hmm. in the movie there was like quotes and so there was this beautiful quote that i wrote and i would love for you to like um explain it talk about it let's have a conversation because this for me was like it, it touched. I was like, oh, I love this. It says, Black people love their children with a kind of obsession. Mm-hmm. You are all we have, and you come to us endangered. Yeah. Um, the quote was by, I don't want to say her name wrong. It's his, Tony. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. So it's from mm-hmm. the book um, Between the World and Me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was because you remember the script came from Nakia. So that was that's a quote that inspired her to write the the entire film um and it's it's one of those quotes that kind of like kick you in the gut where you're just yeah. like oh yeah which is yeah. true we 
we do we do come as black children to our parents as as endangered like we anything can happen to us it's like you have the things that happen to children all around the world like anything really can happen you can you know diseases can happen you can have disabilities things like that which is nothing wrong with those things but like there are things that can happen to your children um they can pass you know but I think as black children we have a very unique danger is that someone can judge us and kill us someone you know as a black woman or as a woman someone can kidnap us some even black black boys can be kidnapped like we can get kidnapped we can be taken just for being black from our parents Mm -hmm. just because of our skin color and that's just an added nuance that's just like not everybody can relate to um so it's, it's one of those things that it's like it's a fear I think of all black people if you have kids or not I feel like some people have a really really crippling fear of having kids because of those very reasons you don't want to bring a child in this world to suffer you want to make sure that if you're bringing a child in the world that they have, you know, the room to flourish. But um, it was something that just resonated with me when I read the script. That yeah, I, was I mean, like, I think as, as, as viewers too, that's, it was powerful. And I think it's also powerful to know that sometimes what you read or what you experience in one quote can right. become the basis of an entire production. And, right. and, you know, words matter and what you say and how you put your things out in the world can inspire right. others to do the same sort of things. I, I mean, I know we can talk about your projects all day, <laughs> but right. I do want to. I do want to jump to a generalization before we go go into our game. Just understanding for folks again who want to do what you're doing, who are inspired by what you're doing, or want to be in the same realm. Like, if you can share, you know, some bits of advice for those who want to be up and coming directors or in the in the field for them to go on and and do what they need to do. Right. Yeah. Um. So I do want to give advice before in danger really quick. I just want to give a shout yes. out to Rafa, who was my cinematographer. Um, mm-hmm. And I'll talk about that too. And just like, thanks for directors and pairing with yes. good cinematographers. Yes. And holding <laughs> on to them. Um, <laughs> but I would say um, for advice is never stop learning. Um, like I said, I'm very much in the beginning of my career. So like watch movies. There's so many videos on YouTube that you can watch about process and um other directors and you know listening to interviews and learning from them I'm really much a huge fan of Barry Jenkins huge like ridiculously huge fan um (laughs) because Moonlight came out when I started at SCAD and it was like captivating for me like I love that's top five for me like best movies Mm -hmm. I've ever seen in my life Mm -hmm. and just like looking at his interviews hearing about his process watching his work like for a long time, I just checked his Vimeo today, but like he had his thesis up for the longest time. And I remember watching it and being like, I need to know, like, where did this all come from? Like, I just want to see something before like you did Moonlight. Um, But watch everything, read. um, If you're like me, I like audio books. I fall asleep sometimes when I read, if we're gonna be honest. (laughs) Um, But audio books work for me. I like to hear people talk. Um, I like to, you know, try to dabble and learn more, take on opportunities that you probably wouldn't have taken. Like Stop Killing Us was another film that we worked on. Yes, please talk about this. Yes. Talk about Stop <laughs> Killing Us because honestly, when you told me it was a silent film, I was like, like, <laughs> like it's like a silent film. Okay. She was like, it's silent until the end. And I was like, oh boy. But it honestly, I was surprised it had such, it was beautiful. And I mm-hmm. felt frustrated. It um, also had a great flow to it even though mm-hmm. it was silent the way you had the music and the transitions and the rewind at the end please talk about that like creative um idea yeah. that was amazing yeah so taking on like things that you do that you probably wouldn't have taken on mm-hmm. so I think after coming off of Willie's letter and Aspire having full-blown teams and full-blown crews and getting used to that and being like wow this is amazing like obviously having a crew is amazing because right we really shouldn't be doing everything. But coming on with that, like Terry Abney, who wrote Stop Killing Us and also is the main actress in the film. Um, she's also my lion sister. So she was like, Kiana, we're gonna make a movie. And I'm like, okay, Terry. And she's just like, <laughs> all right. I'm like, so like, do you have a crew or anything like that? She's like, no, I have one camera person. And I was like, okay, like, mm-hmm. do we have lights? No, okay. What do we have? We have us. I'm like, 
all right and mm-hmm. it was during quarantine and it was just like I'm just gonna take it on so it was me Jazz who was our cinematographer and our two leads and we're just in her friend's house and we're like we're gonna shoot this with one camera right no lights yeah and I'm I just mean, like we're was- using daylight we're just gonna it was so amazing and so strong, Kiana, like just the, so basically it starts off with like this couple in the bed, they're yes. loving each other, the whole scene, the whole, I don't, it wasn't long at all. Um, it was like no, the whole was thing was them like <laughs> yes. in bed loving each other while this, her man is getting ready to like leave the house to go out to work or whatever and right. ends up getting killed by the police. Right. Right. Um, and just the whole thing felt so like, Every, every project that I watched for you so far was so like, oh my gosh, Black Love, it was beautiful. And then um, to fin- like finishing on the Stop Killing Us project, I was like, it's beautiful. I loved it. Um, and I love, and at the end, you kind of rewind it as if like, and she says something mm-hmm. like, you know, don't, like maybe you could st- skip going out. Yeah, it's like, can hey, you stay home today? And he's just yeah. like, if I could, I would. And that's all in the script. Like that all comes from the script. That, that all came from Terry. Um, for creative... I would say slowing down the rewind Rewind was what I wanted to do because I also um, helped edit the film. Again, we did everything. So (laughs) I was like, okay. So at the end of it, I wanted, the whole film is basically the moments before, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously the moments lead up, I don't want to get away if you want to watch it, but it's like obviously the the moments lead up to uh, an ending, but it doesn't end at that ending. It, It goes back to where they started. And I wanted the same way that we were in those moments with them after everything happened, I wanted you to remain and sit with those moments after. So the feelings that you had in the beginning, I wanted you to have those back, but now with this new point of view of seeing them and understanding that, you know, cause it is about police brutality. Everyone can guess the end, but like, you know, we're people before we're judged out in the street we're people where we have full-blown lives we have stories we have love like people who care about us and just like you never really know what your last day is and that that's why the film is silent but at the end that one line is that much more important because the film is silent yeah. I feel like if the li- if the film had dialogue and you know things happening because I think even before it had some dialogue and things like that and we didn't really have like a boom op or anything like that so we're just like let's just just have that one line and it was a strong it just, creative decision. it resonates yeah it resonates because it's like if there was dialogue and they were talking the entire time that line would just be like just a regular line but because you're not hearing them talk at all you're just watching them and living in a moment with them when they actually do speak, it, it hits you harder. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. I, I want to just put a button on, yeah. on what you said earlier, because you were chatting earlier about, you know, the advice and things like that. So for folks who are listening to that, I'm like, yeah. okay, they're probably wondering what else you mentioned the cinematographer, having someone that you can yes. align with and, and, you know, go the distance with chat a little more about that. Yes. Um, having an amazing cinematographer who understands you is very important. Mm -hmm. um because we align so closely like you're a director and cinematographer where you're supposed to be like this because you might have the vision but your cinematographer is the one who who like brings it to life on the camera side of it all so Mm -hmm. it's like they have to be able to be like okay I hear what you're saying I understand you I know how you're working with these actors okay let's bring that together visually and that let me communicate that to the team because they have to communicate that to their team what you said to them so I've been very great like lucky have a blessing of working with um amazing cinematographers um the two that stuck out to me is Blair who was one of the first cinematographers um that I worked with at SCAD who I felt really took time to understand me and my inspirations for my work and my vision for my work and was able to be like, hey, have you thought of this? Have you seen this? Have you seen this film, this scene, this and whatever and be able to like visually come back with like, yeah. I heard what you said and you listened to me and I listened to you. What do you think about this? And awesome. it made me realize how important that relationship is. When I work with Rafa, 
on um, Endangered, it was the same thing. We had our meeting over like eating cheeseburgers basically. Mm-hmm. And he was like, all right, let's do your, like, your vision. I'm telling him everything. And he's just like, yes, let's do th-. Like, it, it's like the inspiration to like sh- bring it to life on his end too. And I also like to work with cinematographers and allow them to be cinematographers. Some people right. um, come in and direct. I mean, everyone has a different directing style. Some people are very much like, it needs to be this way, this way, this way. I look at film as a collaborative space. Therefore, you have strengths that I do not have. Therefore, I'm going to give you what I'm seeing visually in my head. Then you're going to come back to me what you see visually on camera. Like, does it work? It needs to, it needs to be yeah. that collaboration. It needs to work. If there's going to be a disconnect, there's going to be issues and that's going to be a problem. And that's like one of the main, main connections that needs to be the strongest or else it's not going to come out how you want. Oh my gosh. I a hundred percent agree. Girl. Right. Like you have to have the mm-hmm. vision. That's why Akila and I, we be coming with the visions and I love her because yes. we'll come together <laughs> and like nothing is a crazy idea to her. Like I'll be like, no, let's get tattoos. <laughs> let's go paint this guy red and get like, you know, jewelry and like, you know, promise ring. She was like, yeah, girl, let's see. Like, <laughs> nothing is crazy to her. We're both extra. And in that way, it's like, I love her for that. And Akila, tell us what else Likewise. is extra about the Black Creators Club, girl. Tell us what else. Tell us. <laughs> Read all about it. Extra, extra. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> so, so our quick library, we want to let you guys know, um, we worked really hard to do this show. Yeah. The best way that you can repay us is to share this show with a friend and to subscribe to our YouTube page or listen to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts, everything at the Black Creators Club. When you do, please comment rate us subscribe as i mentioned to the show we also read fan shout outs and questions that you may have on air so if you can email us at the black creators club at gmail.com we'd love to get in touch with you um and with that honestly we had such a great time learning more about you from it comes from a you know director perspective when it comes from your projects again we'll link everything out below but we want to give people a little more of a taste of how much you know <laughs> when it comes to, to the industry as a whole. Uh, Evan A, let, it, let us know about the game that we're about to play. Let the yes. listeners know and let Kiana know and we'll jump right into it. All right, you yes. guys. So we are playing, <laughs> are you in the room or are you in the hallway? Um, we are bringing this game back. Okay, honey. <laughs> Um, so basically, Akil and I are going to go back and forth and we're going to read log lines from movies, TV shows. And you are going to guess, or you're going to say um, whether you would want to be in the room, in the writer's room, directing this project, or would you want rather be in the hallway and meaning like you'd pass on it. Um, we're okay. also going to allow you to guess what the log line is. So we're going to read the log line and we'll allow you to guess what, what you think the show or movie is. Um, okay. If you don't get it, we're going to tell you at the end anyway, so don't worry. Um, but okay, Akilah, yeah. start it off. No now. pressure. Okay. No pressure at all. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to tell you, like, watch everything. Oh, Lord. Here we go. <laughs> the first, the first log line reads like this. Embarking on a road trip across 1950s Jim Crow America in search of his missing father, this begins a struggle to survive and over- overcome both the race- racist terrors of white America and terrifying monsters, as if it becomes clear that there's something supernatural at play. So for this content, for this show, are you in the room, meaning you want to direct it, or are you in the hallway? I'm in the room. That is Lovecraft Country. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Big in the room. In the Listen, I am obsessed. 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 With Lovecraft Country. Obsessed. Like, I think I, all three of us are obsessed. Akila went to the final goes, premiere. Yes, I went to the final premiere and it goes down for me as the top five best pilots I've ever seen. That first Seriously. <laughs> it's just, I, I, I'm I, sorry. If it does not sweep the Emmys, I will I will be out there with a picket sign, something. <laughs> Girl, we're joining all types of hell Because there's no, there's no way. Just the depth of the characters, the storylines, how every episode is basically like a different genre of horror or thriller. Like it's it's yeah. absolutely amazing. That entire mm-hmm. show, Misha Green, you are Incredible. bomb. Incredible. And you are bomb. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Listen, okay. Like it is, 
I think we can all say that's like one of our favorite shows on the Black Creative yes. Club. Like mm-hmm. Lovecraft Country is like number one spot for us. Okay. And I'm not even into that genre. So the fact, anyway. Oh, yes, I love horror. <laughs> I love really? horror. Yes. I mean, all my stuff tends to be dramas, but I love, oh, I love horrors. I love that's thrillers. Amazing. I love things that make me have to figure out like what's happening. If it's a murder mm-hmm. mystery, if it's like, mm-hmm. I'm watching The Flight Attendant now and that's, that's been oh, doing it for yeah. me. Okay. Yeah. You tell For me thrillers. how it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's actually the flight attendant is like, it's more comedy than anything. It's comedy, okay. but also th- like murder mystery thriller. Yes. So okay. if you don't really like murder stuff, watch, watch flight attendant. It's really good. <laughs> I'm into the murder. Not a black okay. story, but gonna, really good. <laughs> right. I'm a watch. Into uh, it. She's into okay. it. Okay. Um, okay. Despite the best laid succession plan, tempers flare over intentions. As one of the children's attempts to solidify his eventual takeover, he and his three other Roy children face a difficult choice as company control and family loyalties collide. Are you in the room or are you in the hallway? I think I'm in the hallway. I'm guessing that's the session. (laughs) (laughs) I've heard it's a good show. Honestly, I have not watched it, Um, but I'll be in the hallway. I think it's a great concept, but... I'll be in the hallway. I feel you, girl. Again, can you see yourself in the work? I get you. I get you. Nah, really. <laughs> <laughs> I love. I love that show, though. I see my my future self <laughs> in some capacity. That's all okay. that matters. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. Um, suddenly broke, the formerly filthy rich Rose family is reduced to living in a ramshackle holds ramshackle motel in a town they once bought as a joke. Are you in the room or in the hallway? I'm in the room. I love Shit's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I made my mom. I was like, "Mommy, you have to watch Shit's Creek." She's like, "Why?" I was like, "Watch it. Just, just watch it." She's obsessed with it. I, I love comedy as well. I would love to dabble more into comedy, honestly, because nice. it's weird. My work is very serious and you know, drama is very tragic, but I'm not that type of person. I'm (laughs) very much very silly all the time. Um, (laughs) So I would love to dabble in comedy. So I would definitely be in the room for for Schitt's Creek. Also, Maura Rose is probably one of my favorite TV characters. So many people say that. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like like we're, I think Akilah and I are going to have to give that show a moment. We're going to have to give it a chance. (laughs) Yes. Um, yes. When we saw we saw the Emmys together and we were right. like, what is, what is well, happening? Yes, <laughs> it's like the first season is good. It really gets good for around season four for me. Um, but it's it's I don't know. I love I love seeing rich people fall apart. I don't know. I just do I think it's and like it's, it's that uh that cynical, that little cynical vibe a little bit. Like, okay, it's, it's a, a very bit. it's a very American thing. <laughs> It's great, but it's very funny. I would I would definitely recommend it. Like I, I understand why it got a lot of awards for it, especially their last two seasons. Last season. Okay, yeah. we're gonna mm-hmm. check it out then. Well the Black Creators Club will give it a moment, honey. Okay. Give it a moment. <laughs> give it a moment. <laughs> um, okay. A young black man is invited to visit his white girlfriend's parents' estate and soon realizes the family has a very dark history. It is very rare for a okay, actually I'll just we'll stop there um has a very dark history are you in the room or are you in the hallway does that get out yes girl (laughs) (laughs) i'm like get out i'm in the room um (laughs) literally i just want to be on the wall for jordan peele honestly i don't even need to direct it i don't i don't want to direct it jordan peele did he was perfect i just want to be in the room so i can watch jordan peele's process with coming up with that concept writing the script and directing that film because I am I remember watching the trailer on like Facebook or something and I was like what is this I need to see this tomorrow Mm -hmm. and just being blown away by it I'm Jordan Peele is such a talent he's such a talent talent. like honestly Mm -hmm. that whole movie like I was like jaw dropped like with the tongue the twister I was like oh, I didn't right. see that coming like but I was like confused at first but it's like the more I watch it I mean that's a movie in my opinion that I feel like I could watch over and over and over and over again. yeah mm-hmm. I can watch it's, it out over great. and over again but also like it's confusing because Jordan Peele we're so used to seeing him in comedy but the thing yeah. with horror is like you have to have that same type of timing comedic timing and 
like that timing that comes for horror films to where you actually get that scare or that feeling of anxiety like it's all the same so it's like that's a good it point. transfers mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah. I was not prepared for right? that side of Jordan Peele yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> yes and then talking him in general I was gonna say most really people probably great. weren't yeah mm -hmm. exactly. like him in general gives really great I would say black storytelling like yes. Like, yes 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 he does it you know earlier we were talking about budgets and stuff like you know mm -hmm. they had a very small budget small comparatively for that and in terms of the returns that they were able to to make that was another cop to show hey movies like this matter people would actually proven. go to see it so yeah it's <laughs> always it's always proven if it's a good mm -hmm. movie and we like and it's a concept that resonates yeah it's going to make money it just mm -hmm. is. If you back it, especially with marketing, things like that. Like I think Blumhouse does a good job of marketing their horror yeah. films and doing small budgets and getting like crazy returns. But like, it works. It, it just yeah. does. It works. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We've got a few more. So this okay. one, um, set in Louisiana, this series chronicles the lives and loves of the estranged siblings. Nova, a worldly wise journalist and activist, Charlie, the savvy wife and manager of a professional basketball star, and Ralph Angel, a formerly incarcerated young father in search of redemption. Are you in the room or in the hallway? I'm in the room. Queen Sugar. Yeah. Queen Sugar, yeah, is, <laughs> yeah. Queen Sugar is good, of course, own her own family. Um, mm -hmm. but I would I would love to be to direct that show. I and I mm -hmm. love that she gives so many opportunities for women directors and black women directors to yeah. do that show. A lot of people's yeah. first time shows were Queen Sugar. Um and just to be able to just work with I love Louisiana. New Orleans is my favorite city in America. Yes. I would oh. love to use that landscape and capture it and play with it and have fun with that family. And you know, I love black family dynamics. So yes. Queen Sugar yes. is definitely up my alley. Yeah, <laughs> yes. it hits it all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, the next one is five teens from Harlem become trapped in a nightmare when they're falsely accused of, brutally attack of a brutal attack in Central Park. Based on a true story, are you in the room or are you in the hallway? In the room. Uh, when they see us, probably yeah. the hardest, hard, ooh, hardest thing to watch. I It took me forever to watch when they see us. Yeah. I, I literally was like procrastinating. I'm like, I know I need to watch it, but I can't watch it. I can't watch it. I can't watch it. And then one day I sat down, I was like, you're going to watch it. And the fourth part is what broke me. Like the rest of it broke me, but it's like the fourth part. Yeah, yeah. It, that yeah. broke me. But it, it's again, a story that needs to be tell, told and we need to visualize it and we need to see it from their point of view. It's like seeing a news article about, you know, the children, right. like at that time is one thing, but to actually sit with them and get to know their personalities and their lives and have that rooted in truth to where it's like, you know, that this is like, it's not just dramatized. Like these are these people's real lives and they're showing it to us just with actors and on screen. It just, it feels different. You have a sense of empathy that just is overwhelming. And you're, it's like, it becomes like your cousins, your children, your yeah. family that is, has to go through this. So I, I think that's the power of filmmaking in general. I think Ava does a good job of using yeah. the power of filmmaking to shed light on it's the, the things that we need to know and see yeah it's the connection mm -hmm. you have like like you were saying yeah you have you connected your cinematographer how the film has to connect to you it's that whole connection yeah. but then it connects to us too Akila, what's our last yeah. one girlfriend yes, yes yes so um a heartwarming and emotional story about a unique set of triplets their struggles and their wonderful parents in moments of love joy triumph and heartbreak revelations emerge from parents past while triplets discover deeper oh. meaning in their present day lives are you in the room or in the hallway we had to this, end it we have to end it with this this is <laughs> us okay truth i've only watched about a handful of episodes of this is us no but you knew it okay i knew what it was I knew what yeah. it was because I hear so often and from watching the episodes that I have watched that the writing is amazing and it is. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to cry every day. Every I'm time. <laughs> <laughs> there are moments where it's like, I don't, I know I'm going to cry in this movie. Yes. And it's like, I don't want to cry today. So I'm not going to, or not in the movie. Uh, meanwhile, like, I don't want to like, cry. I'm I know like, everybody loves. Where's my Kleenex? I'm 
I know everybody <laughs> wants to watch everybody's in it and I the writing on the show is amazing I think the storytelling of it is is absolutely mm-hmm. just beautiful and just yeah I did get into it this last season but I I um I don't watch it that much as some I people get you. do I get you. Yeah. So this season be, is a little. <laughs> I want to be in the writer's room of it. Um, mm. I probably wouldn't want to direct it. Um, even though I, I like the story times, I, I do like it. Um, I just want to, I think the writing is what stands out to me the most. Cause mm. I feel like it's, it's more, it's still network TV. Like I feel like you can take creative liberties, but more my style would have been like, want to be in the writer's room to be like, how are yeah. you coming up with these concepts and diving into these characters and developing them? Like that's most interesting to me when it comes to that show. Yeah, First, I think it's, it's like, interesting. I think it's so I interesting think. too, like just to bring it back to like art form and like perspective, mm-hmm. right? Like I feel like the black story, it's unique, but then I feel like it's always told in the most unique way. Meaning like yeah. if, it's on, if it's in a play and it's theater, it's dramatized, it's art, mm-hmm. there's abstract, there's hidden messages. There's always like, like us with Jordan Peele, right? It was like this weird concept that no one understood, but it was like artistic. So I feel like yeah. us as people as like our expression, like we're colorful, we're artistic, we're creative and it, and it comes off in a different narrative and it, and it looks different than like, mm-hmm. this is us or like, um, you know, a notebook, the notebook movie, you know, like it's mm-hmm. there, like it's, it's a different um, expression of, getting a storyline out there and I think for us as black people like we're just really creative I think that we're mm-hmm. really <laughs> dope. and I, I think we are I think Absolutely. that like you know we come up with things that aren't normal and sometimes people don't understand it but at the same time like that is like our art form I think we're always been unique in different types of people like look at Africa like yeah mm, that culture. we've had to be creative that's like our whole life has been set up for like we already started out being creative and then it's like it came in it's like all right we're gonna take everything from you it's like you have no choice but to be creative but to create and I'll think outside exactly. the box so I think that is just in our blood it's in our blood and I think that's a perfect way to end it because I think that was literally like one of my last questions was just like mm-hmm. we've been oppressed and and you know taken advantage of and disrespected but then it's like we always find a way to come back um, yeah. stronger than ever or even keep moving keep pushing forward so um, in that respect I'm kind of like yeah like it, it is creativity that gets us through it um, so I love that that's totally right but you know what this has been such an amazing episode with Kiana and I'm so happy that she's here with us and shared such an amazing strong story with all of her projects and the black narrative because honey we need more of that in the US of A and all around the world so Kiana as an amazing director where can they find you if they want to just hit you up for their next project girl like where can they find you yes um you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at um film afro which is um, Afro is spelled A-F-R-E-A-U-X. Um, I'm on there. Um, also for our, my films, you can find Willie's Letter on all Urban Central's YouTube channel. Um, Stop Killing Us. You can find it on Terry Adney's IGTV as well as I think it's, I don't want to mess it up, but I think it's um, Female Art of Future or... We'll link it too. It'll be right. linked. Um, <laughs> also, I think it's on independent shorts too. But um, so it'll be linked down. And then um, for Aspire TV's Endangered, you can go to aspiretv.com or their YouTube channel to watch um, Endangered. Perfect. And we're going to put all of those links below, you guys, because I'm telling you, these are projects you don't want to miss out on. They're short films, so it's not like mm-hmm. you have to invest a whole lot of time in watching them, darling. So, and you will enjoy them. They definitely resonate, whether you're black, white, yellow, purple, or green. Um, Akila, girl, where can they find you on social media? Yes, you can find me everywhere at Akila Friends. I'm mainly on Instagram, though, and that's friend with two Fs. And uh, feel free to follow my YouTube channel, again, at Akila Friends, where I chat about pop culture, television, from a uh, business perspective. Evan A, where can they find you? Yes, girl. And you know what? You guys, I don't even think we introed in the beginning, except Kiana. But, you know, it's fine. <laughs> if you're episode we were 20, high. listen, you're episode 20 in at this point, like, you either know what it is or you don't, you know? <laughs> um, my name is Ebony A. Chapman, and I've had a great time. My, You can find me on Instagram and on Twitter at Ebony Chapman 12. 
And on Instagram, you can find my Millennial Visionary Series where I interview Black entrepreneurs. You guys, this has been such an amazing episode. I am thank you again, Kiana, for joining us. And we will see you guys next week for another episode of the Black Creators Club. Have a good one. See ya. Bye. Thank you guys for having me.